and I think people don't give social media managers enough credit. Um, you have to be a critical thinker. You have to be able to see around corners. You know, if I post this, what's the good and bad directions it could go in? You know, what is, and, and also have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in the world. Like there are things that you could share that are completely innocuous and, um, but then something's going on somewhere else in the world that it seems insensitive or it seems, you know, like you're capitalizing on someone else's misfortune or like you have to be able to see around corners and also understand what's going on, you know, the pulse of things, whether it's pop culture or the news cycle or whatever. Um, and I don't think people give social media managers enough credit for, you know, having those skills mm -hmm. just to do their job every day. Now, when you're talking about a crisis, um, well, then, you know, I, I don't believe that social media managers should be crisis managers, but but they definitely are a good resource for you to avoid a, a social media crisis. Hi, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Shaheen Samavadi, co-host of the Content Mix podcast, brought to you by multilingual content marketing agency, Vera Content. Today's episode focuses on some recent events. Silicon Valley Bank infam infamously failed in March in what might have been the first ever social media fueled bank run. According to one theory, it can be traced back to an email newsletter, an accompanying tweet, and the Twitter reaction that followed. The frenzy led investors and depositors to attempt to pull out a staggering $42 billion from the bank in a single day. Today, I'm joined by our special guest, Lee Dow, CEO of strategic marketing agency 48 West, to talk about exactly what happened and how a social media focused crisis communication strategy might have helped prevent such an adverse outcome for the bank. Welcome to the show, Lee. <laughs> Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. Uh, Lee has extensive experience with strategic PR and marketing, having started her career in government communications and then rose the ranks in Marcom roles at Fortune 100 companies, including Intel and Honeywell. She founded Phoenix, Arizona-based 48 West in 2011, where she took on several clients in the cybersecurity industry. She was recently honored at the 2023 Cybersecurity Excellence Awards, receiving the Marketer of the Year and Podcast of the Year Awards as host of the Humans in Tech podcast. Lee is a change agent focused on what's next, seeking out new ideas and leading efforts to accelerate growth, build new business and increase brand value. So I'm really interested to hear her perspective on the PR challenges currently facing the banking industry, as well as the changing world of crisis communications in general. So again, welcome to, to the show. <laughs> um, so, so let's just get uh, straight into it. Can you give us some background a bit on, on the situation with Silicon Valley Bank and what role social media played there and what led to this bank run? Definitely. Well, you know, people in Silicon Valley in general, you know, have their mobile devices surgically implanted into their hands. And um, so it's really interesting the way this all went down. Um, the bank, uh, you know, some of the panic started with um, the newsletter, the DIF, uh, which is an email newsletter. So when they crunched those numbers uh, on SVP's financial situation and then put that out there, that's one of the things that really, you know, started the frenzy. Um, and you're correct. It has been documented as the first social media bank run mm -hmm. um, to occur. Yeah. So it's, the, uh, it's crazy the, the, velocity, the velocity that everything happened. And like we said, the $42 billion, <laughs> um, being taken out of the, attempted to be taken out of the bank in a, in a single day. Um, I think it, it must be unprecedented. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I wanted to... I mean, there's so many questions, I guess, <laughs> to, well, to ask here, but yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, yeah, no, so I was going to say that a couple, a couple of things that the bank did right away that um, probably made sense to them, and it I don't think that they were necessarily not good steps to take. I just think the execution probably could have been better. So, you know, when you're when you have a crisis or a brewing crisis, you know, you have options, right? And one of those options is just to address it head on, which is what I think they tried to do at first. Maybe not on social media, but they they had a press release. Um, but but their press release, um, I think it's like a 465 word press release that did not once mention why they were offering, you know, um, uh, like a billion plus in common stock or you know, what it was trying to accomplish by selling 21 billion of securities at a loss. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're an investor, right, you read that release and it's telling you what they're doing, but it's not really telling you why, right? So the first thing, 
if you're, you know, if you're concerned, the next thing that you would do is you would go look at their investor presentation, which they did have, but it's, it's like 30 something pages. It's really densely packed. You have to dig through it to figure out the why. Um, the why is in that presentation, but you really had to go look for it. Um, so while they were slow to react on social media to what was happening, they also didn't make it easy to, you know, to understand what was happening through their other communications channels. Mm -hmm. And I guess the, those communications that they did put out were really targeted at investors and in kind of like investor speak, it sounds like. Yes, definitely. Definitely. And that that kind of goes into, you know, some of the other things that like, you know, you really want to, in a crisis, speak very clearly to your target audience and in terms and um, and in ways that that they can really, you know, not only consume, but like really understand what's going on and and give them a sense of peace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, probably even for investors, it would have made sense to like simplify the message more. Um, but then they probably it sounds like they didn't take into an account other stakeholders that were um, that needed to be communicated with, because it was maybe not only what investors thought, but the but obviously depositors as well. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, which is a, a much broader group of people. Um, well, I mean, what do you think would have been uh, the right way to go about things? Like what would have been the right way to communicate here? Well, one of the things that they could have done that wasn't included in the press release or in the investor presentation, um, but could have easily been shared in social media and other outlets is have a really solid set of FAQs. Mm -hmm. um, they did a, a corresponding um, Zoom call that also didn't go very well. And um, that Zoom call had no question and answer period, nor were there any FAQs published afterwards. Um, so FAQs should always be included in crisis communications, whether they're just for internal use to, you know, anticipate questions that you will get um, and have leaders have the right talk points around answering them or FAQs for your audience um, that, you know, are going to address, you know, the things that they're concerned about. Mm -hmm. And so this Zoom call was uh, for investors? Yeah. And so they... Their, their CEO had a Zoom call um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it just, it wasn't as dialed in as it probably should have been. The talk points weren't as clear as they probably should have been or they weren't followed, right? You never know. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and uh, in, in any of those instances, whether it's, you know, the press release, a presentation, a, you know, um, a video presentation, uh, you know, being interviewed by someone, you really want that person to have a sense of a command presence and and to really impart on the audience that they, you know, have a command of the situation. And so in that Zoom call, I don't it it sounds like the majority of the people who participated in that Zoom call were not left with a sense that, you know, the the CEO had a command of the situation. Mm -hmm. I see. And then when it comes to like um social community so social media communication um mm -hmm. I actually um I was like trying to find like their account and what they said but I I think it might have been taken down or at least temporarily when I was searching um uh, because I could only find an SVB an SVB um Twitter account for the UK um which oh, interesting. had yeah so so I don't know if, if you saw anything that they posted on Twitter at the time like what their response was um because obviously a lot was being said on Twitter were they participating in the conversation at all and should they have My understanding is that they were very quiet on mm -hmm. social media and um and not participating in the conversation um and that that's a challenge right you have um Twitter especially is very prone to rumors and things like that. You know, they could have reached out to Twitter and, you know, asked for some kind of support in, you know, curbing rumors, mm -hmm. um, you know, fact, you know, not necessarily fact checking, but at least putting a notification on posts to encourage people to check their own, you know, facts. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think, I don't think that was done. Um, so they were very quiet and um, I guess I'm not surprised that it would be taken down since they've been taken over by the FDIC. Mm -hmm. um, perhaps that was the transition uh, part of that transition, but it, it's, it's, 
I'm sure they had to have been monitoring social media for what was being said, but it's not obvious um, externally what they did with that information. Mm -hmm. And um, well, like financial institutions typically are quite tight lipped on social platforms. um, And I think that and that used to be considered a, a best practice. It, maybe it's not anymore. Can you can you tell us why that was? And like, did it ever work to to just be quiet on social media? Yeah, I mean, it's a good practice for any company that is, you know, um, has such a high fiduciary responsibility, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it's it's a good practice. Uh, you know, social media feeds in that case should be used for um, more promotional type of activity rather than business conversation Mm -hmm. um and uh you know speaking more to the consumer of bank products Mm -hmm. as opposed to um you know talking about uh the inner workings and operability of a a financial institution it would always be best practice but um in in a crisis you know social media can be your best friend or your worst enemy right um it's it's a it's a it's an easy and fast way to get facts out the door um but uh, it's also a place where, you know, people can take things and distort them and, and you know, put them into um, sort of that um, disinformation category uh, very quickly as well. And so once you step it, one of the reasons why institutions like this don't spend a lot of time and effort on that or choose to stay very quiet is because they know that things that things like this can be twisted and distorted when they even when they do you know their best effort to get the facts out the door um but i do think in this case you know they had a, a public press release they had a public presentation they had a zoom call um these are assets that they had that they could have probably shared through their social media platforms as well mm-hmm. yeah um I, I mean my understanding was that they made some like very um, like made a couple of statements on social media, but um, but didn't do much to like engage with users. I guess that is mm, that is a fine line to to follow. Like in terms of how, can I mean when you are dealing with such sensitive information and it does need to go through the proper regulatory channels, like how how can you um also like make sure that you're that you seem transparent and are like, is there an appropriate way to interact with with people on the on these platforms, or yeah, is it a I matter mean, of just using it as a way to to put out a statement, <laughs> which is what I've typically seen from uh, well, again, highly I, regulated I, institutions? Mm-hmm. Yeah, again, I think that um, it's totally appropriate to engage and interact with customers of the bank when you're talking about, hey, we have this maybe new loan program, or you know, we support small businesses. Um, you know, we we want to I mean, they're a really interesting bank, right? They've always been known for um, being very important to the entrepreneurial com- community um, mm-hmm. and and supporting uh, startups and organizations in phases that maybe other banks would not. Um, mm-hmm. And so, you know, they they're in, they're a kind of one with the people bank in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that. Part of their brand um, is why one of the reasons why people were so surprised that, you know, that they they weren't very communicative. Mm -hmm. Um, Whereas, like, if you told me like Wells Fargo or Bank of America was silent on these things, I'd be like, yeah, that sounds right. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) You know, Um, just because their brand is not to be out there evangelizing, you know, themselves, Mm -hmm. Um, whereas Silicon Valley Bank sort of has a very different brand than other banks. Yeah, but it's kind of um, like a catch-22 because it's like in order to not say the wrong thing, there's so many like levels of approval that need to happen for these for to be able to comment on the financial situation of the bank. Right. But then Mm -hmm. on the other hand, that slows things down and just the the lack of speed itself has an impact on the perception and (laughs) can actually like, um, yeah, have the adverse effect, like the opposite effect of, of what it's supposed to, if that makes sense. Um, yeah, and, what- <laughs> and and they did delete, I looked it up, they they did um, delete their Twitter page. It was SVB underscore financial and the account no longer exists. There you go. So that explains you go. why I couldn't find it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I don't know the reasons behind that. It could just, like I said, it could be that, you know, it doesn't really exist anymore now that it's taken over by the FDIC. So why, why have it in the first place? That is um, true. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, if it were me, I, 
you know, working with them, I would, you know, encourage, I would have probably encouraged them, like I said, to, to use the very um, vetted assets that they had, um, that they were comfortable with communicating to the investor community, and then take those, maybe change the language a little bit so not, and make it easier to get the information that you'd be looking for as a customer of the bank, um, or maybe offer through social media, um, here's how you can ask your questions, like go here, fill this out, call this, you know, call your local whoever, um, but give give consumers instructions to keep them from panicking. Like, mm-hmm. they, again, give you the sense that there's a command of the situation and we're going to guide you through what's going on and, and, you know, be responsible to you, the consumer. Um, so that's a great way to use your social media um, to guide people people towards what the solution is or what the resolution is or how to get one. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, I know like it's it these all sound like excellent like it's excellent advice, but how do you do it fast enough? That's my big question because in the case of <laughs> SVP, all this stuff it happened in the course of a day. <laughs> so how um what kind of team do you have need to have in place? What kind of processes do you need to like be ready for this when something like this happens? Well, a couple of things. One, you absolutely have to know that you have a plan for all of this before anything ever happens. Um, You must have a crisis communications plan, very similar to companies have disaster and recovery plans. You know, Um, they, they spend a lot of, most companies spend a lot of time on, on disaster and recovery plans and maybe not as much time on a communications crisis, but at the speed of social media, um, you know, that's, that's really um, a very risky move. Um, and and in order to have a plan like that, you need to have a really quality, trusted council that has a seat at the table from a communication standpoint. Um, you know, somebody who is not afraid to ask tough questions or give unpopular um, pushback or play devil's advocate, um, you know, really debate with you through the scenarios that could possibly happen um, so that you have a really well, well vetted plan. Um, and and the person also needs to be able to that trusted advisor also needs to be able to translate into very plain language, you know what what you're saying. Um, the kinds of teams that that you really need to have, you must have teams that understand your audience. Um, in Silicon Valley Bank's case, one of the things that I find very interesting is the way that they chose to communicate. They seem to believe because they because they are that kind of bank and they do have a different brand and they've tried to create the sense of community amongst, you know, entrepreneurs and VCs, et cetera. Um, they seem to believe that people should be loyal to the bank. Like a lot of the language, if you go back and look at a lot of their language, they, it was almost like they were em- employing, um, you know, their customers. Well, aren't you loyal to us? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that was a big misstep. Um, I don't think that, that they really understood their audience, that they believed that their audience would be that loyal to them when it comes to their money. Mm. Um, I also think that you need a team that really understands all tech executives. Like I said, especially in the Silicon Valley area, I mean, you've got your mobile phone surgically implanted into your hand. And so, you know, you have to be able to monitor social media. You have to be able to um, really pay attention to the alerts that are coming in and you already have to have a plan in place on what to do about it. Um, and, uh, and you know, it's the speed of mobile, right? It's not even people sitting at their desktop and it's majority of this stuff gets spread by people on their phone. Um, and so really having teams that understand the speed of mobile, understand how to have a solid plan and put it in place in the beginning uh, you know, before anything happens, and then people who really understand your audience. And so that's why it's not enough to earlier when you and I were talking, um, I had mentioned to you that uh, you rarely are going to call a crisis communications company after, while you're in the crisis. Yeah. And that's because like, if somebody were to call me, that's not somebody that I currently work with during a crisis when it's happening, it, ha- it would have to be I would have to understand their business and their audience and their customers, right, to do a really exceptional job for them. Mm -hmm. So when you're looking for the kind of people, they don't necessarily have to be on your staff, 
-hmm. but they do need to be a, a relationship that you've cultivated so that when the time does come to activate, you know, they're ready and they, they know what they need to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it sounds like if if you're just thinking about who's going to handle your crisis communications after the crisis is happening, it's it's a bit too late. <laughs> well, I'll give you another example um, of, you know, it's not a banking example, but do you remember over the Christmas holidays, do you remember uh, Southwest Airlines and all the trouble that they were having? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, well, shortly after, like, and it wasn't even, it wasn't in response to this, it was just unfortunate circumstances. Um, they had a uh, bit of a meltdown, right, with scheduling of their um, aircraft. They had a lot of canceled flights, people stuck, you know, places for days and days. And it just is part of the normal HR routine. They posted a job that was already in the queue to be posted for like a PR crisis communications manager. Mm -hmm. And they posted it on social media and it blew up. You know, all these people commenting on, you know, oh, now you're going to try to hire like a crisis communications person to, you know, get out there and solve these things. And that wasn't the case. That's not what happened. But <laughs> but uh, but that's the appearance it gave. Right. So it sort of like reignited the whole conversation again mm -hmm. um, instead of like it was starting to like not be talked about. Um, and then they posted that job and it just blew up all over again. Um, yeah. So, I mean, there's a lot of got you's in social media, right? And so the other thing on teams that you absolutely have to have, and I think people don't give social media managers enough credit, um, you have to be a critical thinker. You have to be able to see around corners. You know, if I post this, what's the good and bad directions it could go in? You know, what is, and, and also have your finger on the pulse of what's going on in the world. Like there are things that you could share that are completely innocuous and um, but then something's going on somewhere else in the world that it seems insensitive or it seems, you know, like you're capitalizing on someone else's misfortune or like you have to be able to see around corners and also understand what's going on, you know, the pulse of things, whether it's pop culture or the news cycle or whatever. Um, and I don't think people give social media managers enough credit for, you know, having those skills just to do their job every day. Now, when you're talking about a crisis, um, well, then, you know, I, I don't believe that social media managers should be crisis managers, but but they definitely are a good resource for you to avoid a, a social media crisis. Yeah, this actually come, gets to another question I wanted to ask you, uh, because like when I started my career, corporate communications or PR was uh, totally separate from marketing. And now I think those things are melding together. And now this role of social media manager, it used to be something that was an afterthought and you you got an entry level person to do it. And now it's a super strategic role in the company. And um, so so my question is, which area should be responsible for uh for social media or what do you think is like the optimal structure in a corporation in terms of like, yeah, who handles social media communications? Well, when it comes to the crisis part of it, um, I don't think that a social department should be responsible for the crisis. Um, mm -hmm. I think that investor relations and crisis communications are their own professions and disciplines mm -hmm. um, where execution is mission critical. Uh, however, social, like I said, social media managers are the people who best understand who your social audience is. They probably can consult with those people on understanding, like I said, how, how things get sometimes twisted on social media and how to avoid that. Um, and so they should definitely have a voice in the process of how the information gets disseminated. Um, as opposed to putting the strategy together. And they also might have a role in terms of um, noticing when something starts to trend Correct. on social media, right? Or the monitoring Correct. of social media. Yeah. I mean, they're definitely your first line of defense on that, right? They're the ones who are going to see um, the trends and the triggers and things like that. And there should be something in place that they that is part of that communications plan that says, hey, you know, if you say something like this, then we need to, you know, rally the troops and figure out what we're going to do about it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but, uh, well, in my, in my agency, we, uh, we do content marketing and social media marketing. So, but on the, on more of the marketing side of things. So like what you were talking about in the beginning, like the things that are kind of safe to talk about on social media, um, mm -hmm. 
is, is the tip the type of content that we we generally deal with but i think um but since we are the ones managing the channels when there is something more sensitive it's something that we have to like collaborate with their um management team or with their communications department to 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 navigate how to how to respond and manage those conversations um but yeah it's it's interesting though how how that's kind of evolved and how marketers now are are involved also in in the communication the strategic communication because so much of it is mixed up <laughs> correct yeah <laughs> well and you just want the consistency right it's all about brand consistency and if you're not you know you have multiple communicators throughout organizations right and if they're not all on the same page especially in a crisis right that's why i said faqs and talk points are really important part of you know, your crisis plan um, and and making sure that your social media team, your marketing team, your executives, um, anybody who communicates externally understands those FAQs and the talk points. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. I, th I mean, obviously the big change is like the internet and the fact that companies are creating so much of their own content now rather than relying on media outlets. So it's not just right. about PR and like dealing with those media outlets. It's about, um, yeah, uh, about putting out the right message on your own platforms. Um, and that's something that's cross-functional now between comms and, and marketing. Um, but anyway, so I guess kind of to to wrap up the conversation, I mean, what do you think are the lessons that uh, marketers and communication leaders can learn from from this whole situation with Silicon Valley Bank? Well, for sure, know who is talking about you. Um, the diff email newsletter, uh, they should have really been dialed into that um, if they weren't. Um, so definitely know who's talking about you, monitoring for that and when it's trending. Um, the second thing I would say is to be very clear and concise and easy to understand when you are, you know, communicating a crisis um, and give that sense of you, know, you have command of the situation. And then three, I would say just, you know, be human and include things like the FAQs and, um, you know, have, have a strong uh, spokesperson who does give that command, you know, presence um, and helps calm the situation and and explain it in a rational and easy to understand way. So you can, as a communicator, you can write all the right words, but if the vessel, right, that delivers those words, whether it's a press release, a presentation, you know, an executive, um, any of those things, if it's not delivered um, the right way, that's a big piece of it too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, it's yet to be seen, I guess, what's next in, in terms of uh, the situation with with other banks i mean uh we already saw credits suisse also failed mm -hmm. uh, af right after um silicon valley bank so <laughs> it's let's uh, communications i guess can only go so far <laughs> yeah um, i was watching um squawk box before i i got on with you and um they now have a leaderboard of banks and which ones are you know still questionable and which ones are getting you know doing better um, and I was like, that's got to be you know, really frightening for anyone in the, the banking industry, especially banks that are smaller, more regional size banks and those sorts of things. Um, you know, just we've gone from, you know, one bank, um, you know, having this this catastrophe, if you will. And then, it, you know, how it impacts other banks. And in a, in a week now we've got a, a banking leaderboard of which banks, you know, the media thinks will fail or not fail. Yeah. And I mean, it's kind of, um, it's, it's one thing to like control the perception towards your company, but when it's done, it's, it's actually now the perception the macro, of the yeah. entire market. Right. So yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. It's an, and it's a lot harder to nav navigate through and it's a lot harder to, um, you know, control the narrative. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to see how it plays out. Well, thank you so much, Lee, for sharing your insights with us today. It was a super interesting conversation and I learned a lot. I know our audience um, sure learned a lot as well. Oh, thank you. I, I um, you know, usually I'm on the other side of the mic. I'm the one answering, asking the questions. So this was fun for me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have a podcast as well. Um, 
And for those who would like to learn more about Lee and 48 West, um, you can check out her website. It's 48westagency.com. Um, you can follow her on Twitter. It's uh, at Lee Dow and on LinkedIn, Lee Marshall Dow. Um, and like we said, you have a podcast called Humans in Tech. So definitely check that out. Um, and yeah, that's all for today. Thanks for, to everyone for listening in. For more perspectives on global content marketing, be sure to check out veracontent.com slash mix. And if you'd like to get in touch with us or if you have any interesting topic for an upcoming episode, feel free to reach out at mix at veracontent.com and keep tuning in to the podcast for more perspectives on topics related to global content marketing. See you next time. Yeah.